has been around for some decades now. You know, back in the, even the 80s, uh, I was involved in this question where, uh, where the facilities in question were, in fact, uh, being regulated as, as uh, medical facilities in the same way in which hospitals are, but that those regulations were removed. As you're aware, the last couple of years, two years ago, the General Assembly said that they should be so regulated. I've been watching as you've been going through this process, and I know as chairman of the of the uh, oversight committee in the Senate, uh, I saw that five different bills were introduced this last year to undermine the regulating effort. All five of them were defeated, and none of them were passed. The question of whether or not uh, they should be grandfathered, whether or not that these facilities, should, certain facilities, should be eliminated altogether, the whole language just simply be reversed. So I would tell you that I would encourage you to not compromise on this question. The fact is that the patients that come to these facilities should have the same kind of protection, life-saving support that they would if they came into any other environment in which there might be an invasive uh, surgery where their lives could be, be put at rest. The General Assembly has spoken. You folks have the responsibility to have the handle the regulatory end of this. And uh, I appreciate your service, by the way. Let me just tell you, I do truly appreciate the service that you offer it's a commitment of yourselves but the general assembly has been asked to compromise and weaken its position on this point and it has refused to do so so that is something you would already know but i just want to encourage you in that regard thank you senator Appreciate thank you very much for the opportunity next speaker is reverend dr joy gatling and on deck is dr karen Rowland. good morning board members and audience I am Reverend Dr. Joy Gatlin of Hampton, Virginia, and the Ministry of Truth. The board's mission statement is to protect all citizens of the Commonwealth of Virginia, even unborn babies. I'm a minister, a health educator, and a sidewalk counselor at abortion clinics, and I'm also a crisis counselor. Who have talked to countless prospective mothers in the valley of decision to abort or not to abort. John 3.16 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and for even unborn babies. The abortion facilities affect mothers and unborn children. Regulations are in place to make the process healthy and safe for mothers and unborn children. So I pray and fairness that fairness and, inju and justice be done for the continued life of the unborn babies. We are here today because we were not aborted. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Dr. Karen Remley. On deck is Molly Vick. Good morning. Um, first, I'm here today as a private citizen, not representing the opinions of my current employer. Dear Board of Health, I share with you today a letter that I composed, presented for public comment, and then shared with Virginia State Health officials, representing over 30 years of public health leadership here in Virginia. This letter has been read and co-signed by Drs. Kenley, Buttery, Struby, Nelson, Burns, and Dempsey, <coughs> along with myself. I urge you to read it carefully, consider our recommendations about protecting the authority and responsibilities of the Board, the Commissioner, and the Office of Licensure and Certification professional staff to implement regulations fairly, thoughtfully, and appropriately with utmost attention to utilization of professional knowledge and expertise. Dear Board of Health and Commissioner Romero, as Virginia State Health officials representing over 30 years of public health leadership, we first want to thank Chairman Edwards, esteemed members of the Board, Commissioner Romero, and respected leaders of Virginia Department of Health for their thoughtful, ongoing approach to their responsibilities in development and implementation of the abortion facility regulations as directed by the General Assembly and Governor McDonald. As we now approach finalization of permit regulations, we respectfully offer two considerations. The section of the Virginia Code, in the interest of time I won't read it, uses the language consistent with, which is incorporated into regulations of other health care facilities. The proposed regulatory language before you changes the phrase to comply with. The phrase consistent with appropriately gives discretion to the Board of Health, a group of individuals selected for their various health care and public health expertise. As defined by the code, the Commissioner of Health, also selected based on public health and health care expertise, as defined by code, and to the professional VDH employees in the Office of Licensure and Certification. 
The General Assembly voted on this language, and Governor McDonald signed it into law. This language aligns with that used in many areas of the code, including the certificate of need sections. In fact, case law from 1987 specifically dealt with this issue and stated that consistent with as used in the context. Thank you. Thank you. The rest of the letter. Right. Uh, and we okay. appreciate it. The rest of the letter you have. Um, Hi, I'm here to ask you to amend the regulations again to differentiate between new and existing facilities as is the precedence with all other medical facilities and has been the application of the code 32.1-127.001 that keeps coming up, which is the certain design and construction standards to be incorporated in hospital and nursing home licensure regulations, which as Dr. Brownlee said, are to be consistent with the current edition of the guidelines for design and construction. That code came from legislation in 2005, bipartisan, unanimous legislation. Since that time, it's been applied to the regulations for licensure of hospitals, Chapter 410 of the Virginia Administrative Code, and regulations for the licensure of nursing facilities, Chapter 371. In both example, it currently applies only to the design and construction of new buildings, additions, renovations, alterations, or repairs of the Attorney General's office stated in their refusal to certify that such regulations differentiate between new and existing facilities are outside of the statutory authority. Furthermore, the meeting minutes have that referenced as advice to you in the June 15th meeting from the Assistant Attorney General. Either the law is one way or the other, period. Please understand that you are setting precedence here. This isn't how it was applied to hospitals or nursing facilities previously. There are petitions now alive in front of you. There will be a comment period on May 6th to amend those to be consistent. You cannot have selective application of the law. The only defense that was given as to why this was different than those is because these have never been regulated before, they're new. It took a lot of time, and I'll speak very quickly here, but I went back and I found the code in 1947 when they first regulated hospitals, general hospitals. I found the regulations in the archives in the East End in the Library of Virginia. The very first time, they were existing facilities. They had just been defined, and they grandfathered them in. They differentiated between new and existing throughout all of the construction needs. Thank you. Next speaker is Kathy Greenier. On deck is Alana Monti. Hi, good morning. My name is Kathy Greenier, and I'm the director of the Women's Rights Project at the ACLU of Virginia. These regulations single out women's health centers that provide outpatient first trimester abortion for disparate treatment by mandating medically inappropriate and ideologically motivated construction requirements that are not even applied to any existing hospitals or healthcare facilities in the state, much less outpatient services and facilities. There is no credible legal basis for the Attorney General's assertion that the board does not have the authority to grandfather in existing women's health centers. By threatening to refuse to certify your June 15th vote, the Attorney General essentially has claimed veto power over the board's policy decisions, a threat that is intended to force the board to rewrite the rules to suit the AG's policy objectives. That is not the AG's job, however. The law does not give the AG's office veto power over the board's policy decisions about what to include in the final rules. Virginia's Administrative Process Act grants the board the authority to reject the AG's assertions and continue to vote in favor of grandfathering existing facilities. While the AG may then continue to refuse to certify regulations that grandfather, the board is not then bound because of the AG's refusal to certify to change their vote. The board has the authority and the statutory obligation to create regulations for healthcare facilities that conform solely to standards established by medical and health professionals, which, as you know from consistent comment and public testimony from healthcare providers across the state, this is not something that they support. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Alana Monti, and on deck is Jeff Winder. Hi, my name is Elena Yarmoski. I am the Advocacy and Communications Manager for NARAL Pro Choice Virginia. Thank you for having me today. I represent our more than 20,000 members and the majority view of Virginians. The hospital-like construction requirements being placed on existing doctor's offices that perform, for, perform first trimester abortion are overly burdensome, unnecessary, and put Virginia's women's health and lives at risk. 
At this moment, the state's 20 women health care centers that provide first trimester abortion have all been inspected and licensed by the Virginia Department of Health. What you have heard today and will hear today, primarily from religious organizations whose sole purpose is to shut down these facilities, is that these health centers are providing subpar medical care and putting patients in danger. This could not be further from the truth. First, Virginia's 21st trimester abortion providers have operated with exemplary safety records for years, many for decades. Second, there is absolutely no evidence that these facilities are any less safe than other doctor's offices and outpatient facilities in the Commonwealth. Yet abortion providers are being singled out, I repeat, singled out, to comply with architectural standards not even required of existing Virginia hospitals. Third, the regulations being reviewed today are architectural. They require bigger janitorial closets, new faucets, sink candles, and drinking fountains. Even if the violations cited today had any merit, which they categorically do not, the architectural regulations in question would not address them. Let's be clear, these regulations were designed and have been implemented with one purpose and one purpose only, to shut down women's health centers and restrict access to safe, legal, and affordable health care for Virginia's women. I urge you, members of the Board of Health, to reject these regulations. Do not doom these women's health centers who have been honorably and bravely serving the Commonwealth's women for decades. On behalf of the millions of women across Virginia, thousands of petition signers, and hundreds of activists here today, we ask you to put medicine before politics and vote to exempt existing abortion providers from unnecessary construction requirements and help ensure safe and accessible health care for the women of Virginia. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jeff Winder, and on deck is Whitney Whiting. I wish I could believe this public comment session mattered, but the sad truth is that this is a sham. It's a pressure relief valve, allowing symbolic few of us to vent our feelings. We pretend we're participating in a democratic process, and you sit and listen and pretend that anything any of us say could have the slightest impact on your vote. If it were true, maybe you would have listened last year when we told you that the time and space was far inadequate for the number of people who wanted to speak and gotten a bigger auditorium and a lot more time instead of using armed guards to prevent access by the hundreds and hundreds of people outside demanding to be heard. The State Board of Health should listen to the concerns of the people and the testimony of medical experts and act in the interest of public health. Instead, with the exception of two of you whom I greatly appreciate and admire, what you've done instead is cave in to the right-wing, religiously motivated agenda of Ken Cuccinelli at great expense to public health. You've heard from the medical community that these regulations are excessive. You've heard from senators and from legal experts that you do, in fact, have the authority to grandfather any existing clinics. And you've heard from the people that we don't want this regulation to prevent access. You've ignored all of that so far and sentenced an unknowable number of women to die in back alley abortions. There's still time for you to correct this, though I have no illusion that you'll do so. And you might think that when you've voted, to appease this insane tyrant of an attorney general that this is over. But let me assure you, it's far from over. There's a movement growing, a movement of people who understand that this isn't a women's issue, that it affects people of all genders. And we're getting ourselves organized to smash patriarchy in all of its forms, starting with trap. And we're smart, and we're organized, and we're creative, and we're incredibly hardworking, and we won't stop until every woman who needs an abortion can get it when and how she needs it. And you can tell that to Ken Cuccinelli. Thank you. Next speaker is Whitney Whiting, and on deck is Kendall Perkinson. I stand before you today with a heavy heart. I stand before you as an abortion survivor. When I went to the clinic that day, I thought I was doing the right thing. But as I pulled into the parking lot, and I saw that there were only 12 parking spaces. I started to have second thoughts, but I parked the car and I got out. As I was walking to the front entrance, something seemed odd, and then I realized that there was no awning over this facility. Um, I guess I'm just used to seeing them outside of hospitals, but in the absence of it just left me with an overwhelming sense of unease. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to go inside at that point for fear of what I might find. But I was already there, and I guess I didn't want to look like a coward for turning away. When I finally called my name, and I was led down to the procedure room, the hallways, I mean, I didn't have a yardstick with me, of course, but I don't think it was anymore. 
then four feet, 10 inches. Luckily, the procedure went fine. This clinic was already licensed, so I really had nothing to fear. But I don't want any woman to have to go through that kind of unwarranted fear, ever. I've actually never had an abortion. But I, I can't even, I think this, this process, has it always been this sort of a farce? Is it always, I don't think, obviously it hasn't always been because I don't even know what else to say. I, I just really hope that you recognize the implications of a choice you make today going forward. Thank you. The satire is because actual arguments don't seem to make sense to anyone here. So I'm going to keep that going. I'm here filled with concern uh, today as well. I'm not so much concerned for the many thousands of low-income women who over time not have access to safe early abortions. These women are strongly represented here already today. The whiny liberals who ask what these women will do, I think the options are clear. They can raise children whether they're ready or not. My mama did. I'm sure my mama wasn't poor. Like many of these women who at first end up suckling at the taxpayer's teeth, but with the progressive cuts we're making to uh, social services, that won't be a problem for long. They can try to find an illegal abortion. Roe versus Wade guaranteed access, but it didn't guarantee legal access. Sure, they may have to find someone who hasn't already been licensed by the Board of Health and been working in a clinic for two decades, but that's just a free market reality. You get what you can pay for, right? So uh, they, they can self-abort. That tends to be dangerous, but you know what isn't? I ran over a dog on the way here. He probably wasn't ready to go. I, I come here today representing, no, instead of all that, your liposuction constituency. It worked for me. See? Uh, I stand here as the voice of the voiceless. A cry of justice for all the rich women in this state who just want to lose a few pounds without doing any work. While people like those that fill this room have been debating the ins and outs and what have you of abortions, one of the safest outpatient, outpatient procedures performed in this nation, safer than giving birth, the liposuction clinics are left unregulated. Unregulated as hospitals, anyway. According to the Census Survey for Cosmetic Surgeons, a woman is 19 times more likely to die from a liposuction procedure than an abortion. 19 times. How can we as compassionate human beings? justify spending so much time on regulating something that's already so safe for poor people, no less. While those who are succeeding in our society, the job creators, if you will, are 19 times more likely to die just because they want to get rid of their love handles. It's criminal. We have to be bold. We have to push forward for the sake of rich women all over the Commonwealth. That's what we do time. I know that all of you who are here support the health. Thank you very much. The Next health of women are going to... Uh, is Elizabeth Muscle. Your mission statement tells us that your job as a board is, and I quote, to provide leadership and protect the health of all Virginians. It further states, and I quote again, the citizens of the Commonwealth are your primary customer. So you and I have the same mission. We've both been charged with protecting people's health. We do it differently, but our work is equally important, and doing it fairly is the essence of our mission. I'm a physician. I have dedicated the last 30 years of my life to doing my best to take care of women. I deliver babies. I'm leaving here to go do just that. You can't get more pro-life than that. But I'm also pro-fairness, pro-choices, pro-equally, equality, and pro-honesty. I want what is fair and reasonable for all my patients. I had planned to tell you that physicians in this commonwealth are frustrated by legislative involvement in our physician-patient relationship, and we don't call that fair and reasonable. I was going to remind you of the letter we sent requesting you to look at alternatives for regulations as in Governor's Executive Order Number 14. You can't regulate some businesses out of existence because you don't agree with them and call it fair and reasonable. But I think you know that. I think you have been overwhelmed by an agenda that encourages you to shutter businesses by edict instead of due process, and in doing so, lose sight of your mission. We all know that's not fair and reasonable. These clinics have a long record of safety. 
inspect them, review them, change building codes going forward if you must, fully disclose to the public what you find, and let the public decide where they take their business. Please don't lose sight of who you serve and who you, who, what your issue is. Be fair to all of them. Thank you very much. Next speaker is the Reverend Hilda Martin, and on deck is Alice Cohan. Good morning. I am a minister and also a licensed nurse. And I came here today to speak in behalf of the children, the babies. I came to speak in behalf of those who could not be here today themselves, the unborn. I think about them every day and I pray every morning for the unborn babies, 365 days a year, that their lives are spared. I have related to them, uh, I related this to Jesus when the pea crowd, he was innocent, yelled out, crucify him, crucify him. I feel this is the same thing that we're doing with the babies today. Innocent babies, crucify them, crucify them. I'm not here to judge. I believe most of the decisions are happening based on not the knowledge, not knowing the knowledge of the truth about babies. Oh, a fertilized eggs, egg has all the needed elements for the formation of a human body. Doctors don't reach in and put something else in them to have them to grow into human beings. They are already humans. Oh, God's word gives us a warning that there are serious consequences to doing wrong, even murdering. Mur murdering uh, causes other mur murders. And we have seen this in our children, being young children being killed, the babies being shot in the strollers. This is a repercussion of consequence, consequences of killing the babies. My prayer is that people here today and also this board and this nation will come to an understanding of the truth about abortion and all we do from this day forward to be in their call. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Alice Cohan and on deck is Vicki Huron. Hi, as a post-menopausal woman, nostalgic for choice, who's already spoken to you. I'd like to defer to my young friend, <laughs> Emily Butler. Hi, I'm Emily Butler. I'm a student at the University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and an intern for the Feminist Majority. And I want to talk about how important this is for young women and young people in general and their access to health care. I want to tell you about my clinic experience. I wanted to get STD tested, called my doctor. I couldn't get an appointment for months. So I went to a local women's clinic. I got tested that day and had my result within two weeks. For young women, clinics are easy, and they're accessible, and they're affordable. These regulations, they threaten women, young women, college women who live away from their doctors, or women who can't afford private doctors. It's imperative that we maintain access to, to these clinics for women's health care for young women. They provide not just abortion, but many other services that are important, including contraception, prenatal counseling and care, voluntary sterilization, breast cancer exams, pap smears, fertility counseling, adoption services, ovarian cyst treatment, <coughs> STI testing and treatment, and endometriosis treatment. These, these regulations don't just limit my access to abortion, but they also limit access to countless other health services that I and many, many other young people need. Thank you. <coughs> Next speaker is Vicki Yarrowan, and on deck is Gabrielle Schatz. Hi everyone, I'm Vicki Royan. Um, I have been in front of you all so many times that I prefer not to count at this point. The first time I came was in December of 2011, so I've been in this room more times than some people who are sitting around me right now. Um, let's talk here for a second. So I'm a student at VCU, I do social work, right? I had this whole speech prepared for you, but you're not gonna pay attention anyway because you've shown me the past five times that you don't pay attention to anything I say. I worked at an independent clinic for the past 14 months. You don't care about my experiences. I've asked you to ask me questions about what my experience is like. Y'all don't care. 
It doesn't matter. I could be saying nothing right now and it wouldn't matter. In fact, I've asked you to, to look at the 177 doctors that you all blatantly ignored when you voted to, grant, to take out the grandfather clause. Um, we've asked you to think back to when these regulations were first brought up and how you all completely ignored the fact that the original doctor said, hey, you need to keep the old clinics out of the architectural requirements. Not the regulations. It's a, a sigh of relief to see clinics, you know, to see the Board of Health interact with clinics in a way to provide safety. No one here denies that. What we're asking you is to put aside your personal agenda, take away the I'm pro-life, I'm pro-choice, and say, do these architectural requirements make sense? Not the safety regulations, the architect, the building codes. Okay, the reason why you all are going to be able to walk away with smiling faces and say, I didn't shut down clinics, but you will if you do not seriously address this. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for shutting down abortion access because I know, again, from the five other times I've testified, that you all will not pay attention to what I say. I'm also the director of lobbying for the National Order of Women here in Virginia, and I will be back. Next speaker is Gabrielle Schatz, and on deck is Reed Humphrey. Hi, um, my name is Gabrielle Schatz. Um, you've heard all the evidence to keep the abortion clinics open. Um, and so I wonder what there is left to say to this board. I wonder what information could be shared that would actually affect your decision. Could I appeal to your stated responsibilities as the Board of Health? Could you point it out? That, the one, that one of the board's priorities to public health issues is, quote, the reduction of disparities in human and health care and health status? No, these regulations exacerbate that disparity, which has been explained so many times to this board. Could I note that a speci specifically listed approach the board has sworn to employ to reduce wealth disparity in health care is, quote, supporting improved access, access to primary care services? No, because by imposing these regulations, you're consciously and intentionally removing access to primary care. Could it be the knowledge that your actions will, not might, will result in injury, death, and death through illegal and self-performed abortions? No, because you already know this. Why then? What is left if a group of people bound by law and oath to do their best to improve access, prevent unnecessary harm, and reduce wealth disparity in access, instead radically decrease access, increase rate of injury and death, and exacerbate wealth disparity in access? What is there left to say? Should I thank you for revealing to me the way that things really work? That the principles this board was founded on are secondary subservient to political and religious directives? I want to believe that's true, and you have a chance to prove it isn't. I mean, I don't want to believe it's true, um, and I and you have a chance to prove it isn't. Take it, look at yourselves tomorrow, and be proud. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Reed Humphrey, and on deck is Emily Johnson. Hi, I'd like to uh, seat my spot to Frida Cathcart. My name is Frida Cathcart. This board's purpose is to protect the health of the citizens in our commonwealth. Since I've had the experience of sitting on a state advisory board in the Department of Health Professionals, I understand the pressure that the board feels to protect the health and safety for Virginia citizens. I appreciate your service to our commonwealth. Each of you has taken an oath to act in accordance with the commonwealth's constitution. The board's decisions need to be made on the basis of facts for what is best for all Virginians. The board seemed confused at last fall's meeting by the Attorney General's instructions that the board must pass these regulations. The Attorney General has been corrected many times for his interpretation of the law by our courts. The Attorney General's cases have been rejected once by the Virginia Supreme Court and twice unanimously by the Fourth Circuit Court. The Attorney General has a proven record of fallibility when it comes to interpreting the law and the board needs to keep that in mind when receiving instructions from the Attorney General's office. This board is not a rubber stamp. Even the fact that 58% of Virginians oppose these regulations should not come into consideration. Doctors have testified that these regulations 
will harm women's health because they will lose access to affordable care. You must do what is right. The only honorable action that the board must take is to reject these regulations by sending them back to the governor. Rejecting these regulations is the only way to protect the health and safety for all the women in Virginia. If your personal, political, or religious beliefs prevent you from being able to act in accordance to our Constitution on this vote, then you have the obligation to abstain or to resign. The eyes of the nation are upon you. History will be the judge. Thank you. Next speaker is Emily Johnson, and on deck is Lorenta Kerr. Hi, I'm Emily Johnson. I work, uh, or I'm here on uh, behalf of the Richmond Republican Project. We're at the abortion fund here in Virginia. Uh, we've been around for the last 10 years. I've worked with the organization for the last four. Um, I interview women um, every month who are in need of abortion services and cannot afford them, and I'm speaking on behalf of them as well today. Um, we get a call on average every day from women who can't afford abortion. And we turn most of those women away because even though we dispense $2,000 a month for abortion funding, it's, it's not enough. Um, and these are some of the feelings that I hear from women on, on, the, on the phone. Um, I hear from single mothers who are living in anxiety because they do not have the money to raise the children that they already have. And they realize that they can't afford to raise enough money. I talk to mothers who don't want to raise their children in violent neighborhoods. Mothers who are pawning their belongings, selling the title of their cars, asking everyone they know in desperation to find money for an abortion. Can't we trust their experiences? Can't we trust that they know? Um, can't we trust what they know what they're doing? Um, especially under those conditions. Um, and these are the same single mothers who are told that they're a burden on society, that they are taking advantage of the social programs that are out there for them. Shutting down these clinics will probably not affect most of the people in this room, because people in this room can afford to be here. Um, shutting down the abortion clinics are going to affect the people that don't have the money, um, don't have the money to afford them already. And that's who you will be punished. 